If you are looking online and going to watch this message online, we want you to know that on our church website, these notes are available to you. You can simply go and go to Philippians message number eight. And the title of the message this morning is The Great Quandary. I know that many of you um, never heard the word quandary before. You could almost say the clash, but that would go too strangely with the uh, next part of the title, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Um, There's a few of you that are laughing because you remember that song from the 1980s by The Clash, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Um, But that indeed is part of this beautiful picture of what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. And it's not should I stay or should I go over a girlfriend, but it's should I stay or should I go in this life or the picture of going to the next life of being home with the Lord. And that is is indeed what the Apostle Paul is speaking of here. And this message can be incredibly encouraging to us as Christians that are alive in 2019. We have some in this room that are as young as maybe eight or nine years old that are listening to this message. And we have some in this room that are eight in their 80s or in their 90s that are listening to this message. And all of us in between those two ages can gain great encouragement and perspective about life in Christ and about death in Christ as we come to the Apostle Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1. Now, you've noticed, noticed, if you haven't already, notice on the outline here that the first part of this section, this paragraph, we looked at last week. And I want us to read that, um, and that'll just be on your outline, won't be on the screen. But, and then we are going to kind of branch on from this whole paragraph that is, that is largely in the same vein, but with a pivotal verse in the middle. You notice that verse 21 is the key verse for the verses that are uh, above it and the verses that are following it. So let's read this paragraph and let's let us see again this picture of the Apostle Paul waiting on death row for um, whatever God has decided for him, and he is trusting as he writes to the Philippians. Look what it says in Philippians 1. The end of verse 18 says, yes, and I will rejoice. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation of hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. He is saying that whether I live and continue to live, and come and see you again, or whether in my death Christ is going to be honored. Look at verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. He's talking about between dying and, and continuing to live. Yet I am, I, I, I'm not even sure which one I would choose, he's saying at the end of verse 22. Look at verse 23. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, speaking of the Philippians. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's remember a little bit. The review is here before you. Number one, Paul writes from a prison in Rome to the Philippian church that he planted and he loves them. We saw that earlier in the chapter. Number two, Paul is awaiting execution. If you're new to us, you may be surprised that Paul was awaiting execution. He was. He was a captive, first of the Jews, and then turned over to the Roman government, and he was taken all the way to Rome, and he's sitting, chained to a Roman soldier, waiting his, what we would believe would become his execution. And the Philippians that he is writing to, they are a church that's enduring much trouble. So, this letter that we're studying has trouble both around the author of the letter and around the recipient 
incipient, but it's rather amazing as we study the letter, we see that there is this third part that is here, an amazing amount of hope and joy. Look at number three. Paul rejoices that whether he lives or dies, the salvation of God is his sure hope. The salvation of God is his sure hope. Now fill these in. His joy is not based upon his what? His circumstances. His circumstances are horrible. His circumstances are that that he's chained to a Roman soldier. He can't get out and travel the world like he's been doing for the past 30 years. And there are people that are maligning him, both from uh, the Jews that were opposed to the Christian message and even Christians and Christian preachers that were maligning him, saying, look at the Apostle Paul, look at all of his suffering, look at all of his trouble. He can't be a great man of faith. And look at him, he's not even that good of a preacher. We believe that there were other very, very articulate, very, very persuasive, very, very gifted communicators who were also preaching the gospel, but they were condemning Paul and looking at his circumstances. And Paul said that they were condemning me, seeking to even harm me here in prison. So his circumstances are not good. And so we would say to the contrary. In fact, notice this, the, next, the, the second bullet point, his joy is based upon God's salvation. His joy is based upon God's salvation, not his circumstances. The third bullet point, his joy was fed by people's prayer, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and God's salvation promise. Now, I don't want us to just skip over this third bullet point. I want you to look at it and think through it a little bit with me. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. We studied this last week, but it's good for you to remember it. Look at verse 19. We see these things. First of all, he says, for I know that through your prayers, you see, it's the prayers of the people around him. It really matters that people pray for us. It really matters that the people that are close to us and that love us and that are in our heart and we're in their heart, that we actually pray for one another. And God is glorified when his people pray for one another, calling out before him. In his sovereignty, he answers, both moving in us to pray, but also moving in our circumstances to bring about his perfect and beautiful will. So God is at work in the people's prayer. But look at the next part in verse 19. He says, for I know that through your prayers, and what's the next part? And the what? The help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This is the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit, perfectly one and three. Notice this, in, or three and one, perfectly three and one. He is saying it's through the Spirit that he is encouraged, the help of the Holy Spirit. We just got done with starting point this morning. Um, on the section with the covenant. And a wonderful question was asked, wow, how can we keep this church covenant together? How in the world? This seems, man, that, that, there's, there's a lot there about honoring the Lord in this life and honoring the Lord as a church family. How do we do that? Very boldly at the top of one of the main paragraphs, the second paragraph, it says, we en- engage, therefore, with the aid of the Holy Spirit to do these things and to do that. Friends, you cannot live the Christian life apart from God's Spirit. Some of you have said, I'm not going to even try to be a Christian because that is just too much. I would say, you're exactly right. That's probably a good move. You shouldn't even try to be a Christian. But what you could do is come to Jesus broken and needy and say, Lord, come do it in me because that's everything that his word says. His word says, come to me just like you are And I will not only come and cleanse you and work in you and save you, but I will then empower you to do what you need to do. And while you're here on this, in this earth, you're going to have your flesh that you're still dealing with, seeking to be a Christian, honoring the Lord, maybe even as a member of the church, seeking to do that. But all the way through, his spirit is here to empower us. In fact, we're going to see Galatians 2.20. It's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, listen to this, I live by faith in the one who gave his life for me and loved me. That is the picture of the Christian strength. So it is the people's prayer. Notice the next one there. It's the Holy Spirit, but also we said it's the word of God. 
Because the Apostle Paul is quoting from the Old Testament from Job. He is saying that my hope is not going to be disappointed. I am not going to be disappointed by what God has done. And he's quoting from Job, one of the great sufferers in faith um, for the glory of God, unto God's great grace and glory that he would do that. And then at the end of that, we see, look at the end of verse 20. It says, that with full courage, now as always, look what it says, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. This is the salvation of God. And so, Paul's hope was in God's salvation promise. This is the beautiful part. All of those things together. Now, I want you to take your pen and put a big circle around that third bullet point, the whole thing. His joy was fed by people's prayer, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and God's salvation promise. This is the same key for Christians at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. If you want to make it through the troubles and the struggles of this life, if you want to be strong, if you want to have joy when trouble comes, the formula, quote-unquote, is the same. It's Christians helping Christians. It's brothers and sisters praying for one another, supporting one another. Look at the next part. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. It's not you. It's God's Spirit. This is what it means to come to Him by faith. And notice this. If you want to stay with God, you have to study the Word of God. Know what He has said. The Word of God is what strengthens us for obedience. It's what corrects us. It's what comes and transforms our minds and our hearts. His truth in us. And then notice this. It is resting in the salvation promise of God. The fact that He does not make a promise and then not keep it. He keeps his promises perfectly. Friends, be encouraged. Be encouraged to let people pray for you. Be encouraged to ask for the Holy Spirit's power to be the person that God has called you to be. Be encouraged to stay in the Word of God. Let your mind and your heart feed daily on the Word of God. You must read the Scripture. You must learn and study the Scripture. And it's not a duty so much as it is a privilege. And and it's a beautiful treasure hunt each morning as you come to God and you get to discover the riches of his word. And then you rely upon God's salvation promise. This is the way through a world that has fallen, filled with sin, strife, trouble, cancer, car wrecks, disappointments, broken relationships. This is the way to the joy that God offers. And it's not a nebulous thing. It is a sure thing. Well, this morning as we keep going, I want us to see here in verse 21, and this is our main text for this morning, and we're going to blast through it this morning. In verse 21, look what it says. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That being the anchor passage in this, and we're going to study what that means a little bit more this morning in just a moment. Look at verse 22. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful label for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account, on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. I want you to see this. He, this guy, had, he, he's talking about a reason to live. And you talk about any reason to live, it is the reason of Christ. That's the picture. He says, for to me, to live is Christ. You see, Christianity without Christ is a sum total of nothing. Fill that in. Christianity without Christ is nothing. It's amazing that some people will come and they'll look at Christianity from the surface. They'll look at the activities of the church. They'll look at what is is their perception of what Christians are supposed to be or what they're not supposed to be. And they, they can make their total assumption and make their total decision based upon what they see 
in Christians. And that's part of the reason that a Christian witness is so very important. But the message of of true Christianity is that you don't come to Christianity just through Christians. You go beyond the Christians that are before you, and you look to the one that they are named after. You look to Christ himself. See, there's a, there's a lot of people that they're so tripped up with what they see in Christians, whether it be accurate and good or whether it be really inaccurate, really not true, the things that they have in their mind, and they fall short of looking to Christ. But that's the whole message of the Bible, is to come and to look to God, not just look to his followers, not just look to the circumstances that are around them, but come and learn of God, not just the law, not just the religious things that seem to be on the surface, but the true message of the Bible is God is saying, come and find me. And so our message should be in the way that we live and what we preach and what we say, we should be saying, come all the way to God. Don't stop with cultural Christianity. Don't stop with just looking at the church from a distance. Don't stop, please don't stop with the TV preachers. You know, there's a lot of people that do that. They look at the TV preachers, and they, you know, the hair people on television. And, you know, they look at that and they man, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're, but they're, they're judging the creator of the universe based upon a false impression of who he truly is. What I would say to anyone is not just come and look at my life, but I would say, no, you need to look way past me, and you need to look to the one who bought me with his own blood. That is the picture. You see, Christ is everything to the Christian. Everything rises and falls on Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here, is that for me to live as Christ, if I'm going to continue on as a jailed person, maybe I'm going to be set free, and I'm going to get on another boat, and I'm going to sail back across it. I'm going to, I'm going to go back across the Aegean, and I'm going to go up to northern Greece where Philippi is, and I'm going to see these Christians again, and I hope to go on some, to various other places. He's saying, for me to do all of that is for the glory of Christ. If I live, it is for Christ. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying there. Look at the, uh, verse 21 up there that I've underlined. For to me, to live is Christ. This is what he's saying. Now, look at Galatians 2.20. We can't get away from this. This is what, he, this is what it, that, that very picture is. Look at verse 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but look what it says. But Christ who lives in me. You see, for me to live is Christ. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Paul had no illusion. He did not think that he was ever going to be the perfect Christian in his flesh. What he saw and what he knew is that God is coming and he is living out his life through me. And that's the beautiful relationship of God's people to him, is that God comes and empowers us to do what we cannot do. There's many people who come and they say, well, I just can't do what you guys do. I'll fail. I'll wind up losing it. I'll wind up failing as a Christian. I can't do that. And we would say, yeah, well, join the club. That's what we do. We fail on a regular basis. Come fail with us. Because we serve one who never fails. We serve one who comes and lives with us in our weaknesses and lives with us in all of our struggles and our troubles and our failures. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. We come to live with him by faith. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, let's say it out loud together. What have I underlined there? He is a new creation. Wow. So when we come to Jesus, he makes us to be totally new spiritually. Now, you may have the same body, but the Bible tells us that we must be born again if we're going to know God. Now, what does that mean? You're born once of your mother. You're born again of spirit. And that's what happens when someone comes to faith in Christ. 
They're given a new identity, no longer in their old sin and no longer under the sin of Adam, we say, but they come to faith in Jesus and they're given a new identity in Christ. He literally changes who our soul is, is identified with. We are now identified with him. Look what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has, pa- the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. I love that. I didn't underline that. I want to encourage you to circle that. All this is from God. This isn't from man. This isn't made up by Paul. This isn't made up by somebody else. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. So not only is his intention to save us and give us a new identity in Christ that is no longer identified by our sin and our failures, but now we're identified by Christ's victory. That is the picture of what he has given. But look at the next part. He not only saves us, but then he employs us. He deploys us to go out and to join the ministry of reconciliation. He uses us. You may want to write that down there beside that verse, that he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, means that he, he enlists us in his work, in his army. Now, there's unfortunately a lot of Christians who have ignored the last part of that verse. There's a lot of Christians that have never embraced the last part of verse 18. They like the part that says, this is from God, and he has reconciled us to himself. But somehow, the last part of this, they think, oh, well, that's just for the pastor. Or that's just for those young seminary students that we send off up there. They're up there learning about the ministry of reconciliation. No, friends. We see in this verse that every single Christian that is called to faith in Christ is employed in his work that God intends that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So this is why Paul would say, for me, for to me, to live is Christ. He has been given this calling. Now, this is a very interesting looking fellow that is on the screen in front of you, I know. Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. And Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf is kind of the German equivalent of William Carey. William Carey was the father of modern missions out of, uh, of England. But the German equivalent of that was Count Zinzendorf. And he, he's what we would call the father of German Protestant missions. So he was a, a, a missionary advocate. And he, he would promote the fact, the fact that German Christians, evangelical Christians, needed to be preaching the gospel around the world. And here's what his statement was. I have but one enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. It is him. Only him. He's saying, you ask me what I'm excited about? I am excited about Christ. He is the thing that gets my motor running. He is the thing that drives my days. He is the thing that I dream about. He is the thing that I daydream about. He is the thing that I plan for, that I save for, that I work for. It is Christ in Christ alone. There's a lot of Christians who would say, Jesus, you know, my life is, is in Christ and Christ alone, but somehow there are other affections that take the place. So we, we may say that with our lips, but there's other things that, that tend to come in between us and God's grand plan. Sometimes it's our career. Sometimes it's our children. Sometimes it's our family. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it could even be your church. It could be the organization of the church and that some of the things that are like that. Now, I want to say to you, if it's healthy, this is going to be encouraging the kingdom work and God's kingdom work through you. We can often do a great deal through our church family if things are healthy. If things are healthy. But if our mindset is wrong, if our motives are wrong, we can put other things in front of Christ. God has called us to be a people who remain singly focused and to say, all that I do, all that I work for, all that I'm interested in is for the glory of Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He says in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ 
And then look at the next part. What does he say there? To die is what? To die is gain. Talk about a guy ready to die. I'm sorry, it rhymes. I just have to say it that way. Talk about a guy that's ready to die. That's what we see in the Apostle Paul. He's ready to die. I'm going to show you a few verses. And what's interesting about these four different passages that I'm going to show you, um, two are from Acts, one is from Romans, another one is from Timothy. So it's both the, the, the book of Acts is all the story of the apostles' lives and the, the full unfolding of the church over about a 30-year period. And then we see the letters, the, the letter of Romans the, written to the Roman church. And then we see a letter written to Timothy. So it's another letter written to Timothy himself. In this, we see over many years of writing, and we see in different, different circumstances, whether the account of what he said or the things that he wrote to Rome or, to, or Timothy, here are just four examples of the fact that Paul, totally in his mind, was ready to die. He was genuinely ready to die. Now, this is, this is instructive for us as Christians. This is instructive for us at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, because Somehow, there's, there's many of us that have in the back of our minds, ooh, ready to die? I don't know about that. I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die. In fact, that scares me. In fact, it, I really don't like to think about that. Pastor, I wish you wouldn't even think about this. I wish you wouldn't talk about this because the issue of death, man, that, that just really sets me on edge. But there's some that, how about this? They think, ah, never going to happen. Now, I'm not sure how they think that, because the last time I checked the mortality rates, it's 100%, right? There's only like four that made it off the planet without that, and those were all under the direct work of God and His, and His Spirit and all that He was doing. So, so we, we see this, that this is His glorious plan in this, and, and we can be ready to die like the Apostle Paul. And maybe this sermon will start you thinking biblically concerning your life and your death, your mortality. I hope so. If you are a true Christian, if you are a Christian who is truly resting in Christ alone as the hope of your salvation, I want you to know that you can go bursting through the door of death into the glorious arms of Christ with no fear. We sing it when we sing in Christ alone. We sing the, the, the very words of no fear in life and no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Are you a true Christian? Do you, do you realize that you can be ready to die? Notice these words. Paul had eternal purpose and perspective. So part of his being ready to die is that he understood why he's here. He understood that if my life continues, it's for Christ. And if I die, he's made the promise of eternal life. And so he, he has it in perspective. So he has purpose and he has perspective on this. And I want you to see it in these verses. Carefully read them. Don't turn the page over early. Look at with me. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. And this verse had a huge impact on my life when I was 19 years old, overseas with Operation Mobilization many years ago. Look what he says. Paul, the Apostle Paul's writing and he says, or, or speaking when this is recorded, and he says, but I do not excuse me, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. So my life is not valuable. I'm not worried about it. It's not precious to me. If only I may finish my course. This is what matters to him. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. And what is it? Underline it. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And isn't it interesting that he says, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. You see, friends, we have good news to testify to. It's not just, quote unquote, the gospel, as, as wonderful as that is. But here, we, the emphasis here is that God's gospel is a gospel of grace, and that means undeserved favor. This is good news to tell the guy. 
that on the surface at first doesn't even want to hear it. And as God begins to work through that, and as God begins to work in him, and it, maybe a question begins to come about out of something that you said as you've shared a word of Scripture or you've been living out your life before him, that he comes to see that the message of the gospel is that there's a holy God that has had grace upon us. This is the picture. And that he is saying... My life isn't valuable to me. I'm ready to die. No big deal. But what is really important to me is that I be faithful to his calling. Now, that is perspective. That is a beautiful perspective. What about this one? In the very next chapter in Acts 21, the Apostle Paul, is, he's determined to get back to Jerusalem to deal with some things that are going on back in Jerusalem. And when he's traveling through Ephesus, notice that I put a note out here, 21 verse 13. At Ephesus, a man prophesied that Paul would be arrested if he went to Jerusalem. And so a man says to him, he took off his belt and he wraps it around his, his, his arms and he says, Paul, if you go on to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. And then everybody freaks out. Everybody's like, oh, Paul, you can't go to Jerusalem. Something bad may happen. Look what Paul's response is. Look at verse 12. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him, talking about Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Look at verse 13. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of of the Lord Jesus. You see, he's, he's ready to go. Look at the next part. You can flip the sheet. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 7 through 9. We see it again. This is a very clear picture in a more theological sense of the whole picture. In verse 7, Paul writes this. He writes, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. Verse 8, for if we live we live to the Lord. Doesn't that sound like verse 21 up there at the top of your page? For to me, to live is Christ. So look at verse 8, Romans 14, verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, I love it, we are the Lord's. You see, to, to continue on through all of the persecution and all of the trouble that he, is, that he is experiencing, this is part of the picture. He understands, I am the Lord's. Whether he decides to let me live or whether he takes me home, I am his. Look at verse 9. For to this end Christ died and lived again. You see, it's the resurrection power of Christ that is his. And that he might be Lord both of the living and the dead. He's saying, I have nothing to fear. My Lord is the one who has power over life and death. And so, I'm safe. I'm with him. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 through 7. This is also another beautiful picture of the fact that Paul is ready to die. Look at verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but look what it says, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is the picture of he's completely comfortable with the fact that it is the end of his life. He is ready to die. And as he dies, he's saying, the crown of righteousness is not due to his own righteousness, but it is all because of the Lord, the righteous judge, who has made him this way. So all of this points to two great priorities in Paul's life, and they're priorities that should be in my life, and they're priorities that should be in your life if you're a Christian. First of all, there is the work of God's kingdom. That's what Paul is saying. For me to live as Christ is, it is the work of God's kingdom. It is that I am living for him. Not only the work of God's kingdom, but also the promise of God's kingdom. He has promised his salvation. He has promised that his work is going forward and that we are privileged to be involved with it. This is exactly what we see in the, write these three, three things in, when you think about the life of Christ, when you think about his work, when you think about his death, this is what we see in Christ. Paul is only mimicking what he saw in Jesus Christ. 
You see, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Jesus came to fulfill his role in the third person of the, or the second person of the Trinity, bringing to salvation the hope of God's grace for a fallen and lost world in sin. So, in his life, in his living, in his work, his work, what we call his work on the cross, when he suffered and he died on the cross, and then in his death, we see the payment made for us. And the Apostle Paul is fine with every bit of that. Now, the Apostle Paul isn't dying in anyone's place, but the Apostle Paul is the representative of the one who did die in men, men's place, in women's place. So, this is the picture of the Apostle Paul saying God's work in his kingdom and his promise of his kingdom are what drive my life. Now, when we also think about this, we think about the reasons behind this, the reason to live and the reason to die. And we see it in verse 22 through 26. And I want you to see it with me again. Look up there at the top of the page. In verse 22, it says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. You see, this is a quandary to him. This is a, uh, this is a difficult decision for him. He's saying, I really want to go home and be with Christ. I really want to go be with him. All that he has promised is true. You see, this is part of the question of whether you really believe the gospel. When I see, <clears throat> excuse me, when I see someone who is, I was going to say, deathly afraid of death, when I see someone who is truly afraid of death, I'm wondering, do you believe the promises that God has made? And some people would say, well, I, I don't know. What do you mean? You see, so the problem may be that you don't know the promises are made. This is why we study the Bible. This is why we need to read the Bible. This is why we need to be students of the Bible. This is why you need to have a quiet time each day, is so that you can start to see what are all of the riches of the promises that God has made to you. But the, the question becomes, if you're so afraid of death, do you not either realize or do you not believe the promises that he has made? Because if you come to be familiar with all the promises that he has made about your salvation in Christ and the fact that his word is at stake and he is a God of truth and a God who never lies but always fulfills his word, you can have a really good comfort with that, that I go into life and I go into death with the confidence that God is with me and working through me. So, this is a reason to live and a reason to die. The first one is reason to live. You see, you have a reason to live, and this is it, a Christ-glorifying life. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. He's saying, I want to glorify, I want to magnify, I want people to know. I want people to know how great God is. I want people to know how great his grace is. I want people to know what he has done. This is a life seeking to point people to Christ. That's a Christ glorifying life. You see, this is living, fill it in, this is living in obedience by making disciples among the nations. That's what the Apostle Paul was very concerned about doing. Look what it says up there in verse 22. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So he, what is the labor? What is his job? He, he's saying, I'm living my life so that people would know who Christ is. Look at the next bullet point. This means living by faith. This is pleasing to the Lord. In Hebrews, we learned that without faith, it is impossible to please God. But when we live in faith, this is pleasing to God. And so, it becomes very pleasing to God when I live my life trusting in the Lord. And you know, sometimes that, that is um, uh, more difficult than at other times. Sometimes when things really don't go the way we wanted it to go, sometimes when, when things really turn and, and they're very, very hard, and we, we, are, we are tested in our faith of whether or not we're going to look to God and trust in God. I have to tell you that one of the BGR videos that I saw on the Bahamas, 
It was a woman that was, had video from her phone, and it was her audio, the, the, the voice of her making statements as they walked through her house during the storm and after the storm. So up to her kitchen window, she could see under the water. The water was higher than her kitchen window, and it was like looking into an aquarium. And here she is in her house, and she's saying, oh, look, praise God. He is great. He is wonderful. I am trusting in him. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I am trusting in him. I am trusting in his goodness. I'm trusting in his promises. And the video goes on for three minutes where the long and the short of it is her home is completely destroyed. And she's saying, you know, God is good all the time. He has let me live, and I'm trusting in him, and he knows what he's doing. Look at that. I even have some shirts left over. This is so good of God to let me have some shirts. And this is, you know, she is looking at the circumstance and her response to not only danger and threat of her life, but also losing really everything she has except for a few shirts, is that God is good. He knows what he is doing. He knows the end from the beginning on a matter. You see, this is part of the picture of that which pleases God. And God is good in the process of that. Look at the third bullet point there. Not only living in obedience by making disciples and living by faith amidst the circumstances of the life, but living in sacrifice for those who need us. We see that in verse 22. In verse 22, he's saying, I'm, this is my fruitful labor for you. And look at verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul is concerned about Philippians, and he's the one chained to a Roman soldier. So his mentality is, I am concerned about others. You know, it's kind of amazing. There are people that are around us have you, have you noticed people like this, that when they are going through great difficulty and trouble, that they are concerned for everyone else? You, you say, well, wait a minute. Um, you're the one that's just been diagnosed with cancer, and people are coming to see you, and you're fixing them something to eat. And you're, you know, these are the people that just, you know, they, they just, they're concerned about you. They're just, they're not all wound up about themselves. And why? Because they're at peace with what God is doing and that they are seeking to serve others. It's the sacrifice for those who need us and that are around us. Now, I just want to say, uh, sidebar out here, out to the side of number one is this. There are many people who say, well, you know, I wish I really had a reason to live. I'm not sure I do. What can I do? And I sometimes hear this from maybe people who are really struggling with a a great illness or a great trouble in their life. They're saying, wouldn't it it just be easier for this to be over and for this to be done? Or sometimes it's it's someone that is advanced in age, and they say, what good am I anymore? I I, I can't do what I used to do. And we kind of go through a real crisis of identity. And we begin to think all this pain and all this struggle is just not worth it. And, and I, would, I would like to be free from this. But I, I just want to say here, think about the Apostle Paul. He's chained to a guard in a prison. And if anybody would be justified in wanting to check out and leave, it would be him. He had health problems. He had people attacking him on the outside. He had... He had Roman problems of, of, of legal issues that were all over him. And, and here, he is ultimately concerned for these people that are looking to him. I had a conversation with a woman that does not go to our church um, who said that she is a believer. She is 94 years of age. This week, as I was talking to her, and she said, you know, I don't know why the Lord still has me here. I'm 94, but this woman is as sharp as that. Her brain is not missed a thing. I mean, she is completely engaged intellectually. I was amazed at that, both talking about things current and distant. And then she told me about her five children and her great-grandchildren, uh, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. And I just said to her, I said, Betty, you have no idea the influence that you have. 
She said, I'm the only one left of my generation. I said, Betty, you're the matriarch in your family, and you're a Christian. And you said that some of your children are believers and some of them are not. And some of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are believers and some of them are not. I said, Betty, you have an opportunity that practically no one else has in their lives. You have the opportunity to pray for them and to speak to them and to set an example for them in a very powerful way. And she, I said, that may be the very reason that you're still here. And even as you live your life and struggle through to death eventually, the way you die can show them Christ. It may be that it's not until after you're gone that they live in an act upon their grandmother's faith or their great-grandmother's faith. You see, the Apostle Paul is talking about up there in verse 22, fruitful labor for me. If I continue, fruitful, here he is, chained to a Roman soldier. How's he going to do fruitful labor? And we see that he sees every day as the opportunity to give, bring God glory in these things. This is a reason to live, a Christ-glorifying life. But also we see a reason to die. And this is the picture. Man, this is, the Apostle Paul says it. Look what he says up in verse 22 in the middle of it. says, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. Look at verse 23. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. Underline it. For that is far better. You better believe that that was the truth for the Apostle Paul. You want to be chained to a smelly Roman soldier? Or do you want to be in the halls of heaven with the Savior who died for you and promised you all the things that your mind can't even comprehend. You see, he is saying it's far better to, be go, home, to go home to be with the Lord. What a beautiful perspective. This is a glorious union with Christ. This is a reason to die, that you're finally at home with the Savior who dies for you, who died for you. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Here's the picture. You are finally, the flesh is going to be done away with. There's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. And listen to this, no more sin. I mean, that's my biggest problem. It's not that, man, I've had two shoulders worked on, two knees worked on, and those are the least of my concerns. My wicked heart is the problem. That's what causes me more pain and more struggle than anything else is my fleshly, wicked heart that is bent away from God in my flesh. But in Christ, in Christ, he is changing that. He's transforming that. The Bible calls that sanctifying that. He's making me more like what he has saved me to be. It's not that he has is, he is not yet saved me. He has saved me. But he's in the process of making me more like himself, bringing me into conformity with his son. And finally, one day, it's going to all be done, and I will finally be at home with him, made righteous even in my body. And I rejoice in that. That's what 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 is capturing Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. We just read that. Look what it says. What we will be has not yet appeared. But when Christ, here's the idea, when Christ comes, look what he says, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. I long for that day, but we will she'll see him as he is. And so this is the picture. This is glorious union with Christ. Look at the next one. Psalm 17 and verse 15. David would write these words, As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I will be satisfied with your presence. Man, when you close your eyes of death in this life and you open your eyes in heaven, you're going to be satisfied with the presence of God. That is a reason to die. That is a glorious reason to die, to finally see the Savior face to face 
that has died for your sins. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What a beautiful picture of the reason to die. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So, we have a reason to live. That's a Christ-glorifying life. We have a reason to die. That is the glorious union with Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. It's interesting that the, the statement in verse 23, he says, I, I'm just real honest. I, he's saying, I'm hard-pressed between the two. I want to live, but yet I want to die. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. You know, there's only really one main section on that. That's in verse 23. Above that and below that is being faithful in this life. We need to be willing to be faithful in this life. Even in our suffering and in our hardship, we are showing people around us what it means to trust in God. I think about different people in our church that are greatly struggling with health problems. And I think about their faithfulness in the midst of that health problem and how I sometimes leave a house where there is a great struggle going on and I leave feeling so amazingly encouraged by their faith in God. I leave built up by their faith in God. And it's not just me who sees that and experiences that, but it's their family and it's their people around them that they continue to trust in God. It's like the Bahamian woman that's saying, God is good. God is good. Look, he's taking care of this. He's taking care of that. In the midst of all the things that are struggling around us, we show that God's promises are good and true as we trust in him. So my question is, what about you? What about you? Are your views of life and death aligned with the surrounding culture or God's Word. You see, the surrounding culture either comes to death with fear or they come to the issue of death with denial, that it's not going to happen. Don't want to be involved with it. Don't want to touch it. You know, uh, all, of those, all of those issues. Christians at Sheridan Hills need to say, no, my views of death need to be lined up with God's Word and what God has said about this life, and what God has said about the next life, and that I can have confidence in that. You see, so we can either have fear, or we can have anticipation. We see in the Apostle Paul, he is anticipating life in Christ. In our study of secret church, we've been studying this issue of life and death and heaven and hell, and we see that it's very appropriate for Christians to be anticipating not only the return of Christ, but their own glorification with Christ upon their death. That is an appropriate Christian view that we anticipate. We look forward to being with Christ. It's so much grander than fear. Well, what about the next one? Do we have a view of selfishness or do we have a view of selflessness when it comes to our life and our death? The Apostle Paul had an, a view of selflessness. He's willing to go on in all of his trouble for the sake of the Philippians. I really want you to think about that question. If you're a Christian in this room, I want you to really think about that. Do you really show and do you exhibit faith in what God has said about death, about your death? There's others in this room that you would say, well, I don't know that I know that I know that I'm a Christian. In fact, I know that I'm not, and I need to trust in Christ. Or perhaps you've been asking that question. My question to you is this, are you finally ready to believe and receive Christ as your Savior King? Because he has said, I will receive you. If you come to me, I will not cast you out. Some of you would say, well, you don't understand my skeptic heart, or you don't understand my hard heart. You don't understand how much I love my own sin, or whatever it may be, whatever excuse you give. Listen to this. The Bible says 
that God has promised that all who come to me, I will not cast away. So he invites you to come. He says, come. Come to me, ye who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want to call you to receive Christ today. I want to call you to say yes to him this morning. Let's pray.